Hey guys, Coach Rob here. Um, <clears throat> welcome to the introductory uh, video for um, HRV Coaching Foundations. Uh, something really new that we're, we're doing here. Um, as you know, there's not a lot of people out there doing heart rate variability to begin with, so we are on jointly the leading edge of uh, something that Shannon and I feel are, is one of the most critical things someone can be doing to contribute or take action towards maintaining or improving their health and the durability of that health over time. This will be something, we're quite confident, this will be something that will be normal in about 10 years. But right now we are on the leading edge and really um, driving how things are going both within the apps and within the industry. There's barely much research on general fitness. While the heart rate variability has been out there for 50, 60, 70 years, it's been in special populations, uh, astronauts, professional athletes, Olympic athletes, NCAA Division I and II level athletes. And they've been using it to understand stress um, for recovery and athletic training. And that's honestly where we started to look at it uh, for our applications. But once we started doing it, we saw that there was a much broader application for general fitness, general living, and honestly improving someone's health. Uh, a lot of us, including me, think that we handle stress pretty well and that uh, we don't need much help or insight on it. And that's just because we swallow it and consume it. But that does not mean that the internal physiological response to our stress is not costing us some years and some life and increasing the wear and tear of what's called our autonomic or uh, central nervous system. <clears throat> so in doing so, heart rate variability is now very affordable for the tools. Um, used to be like 35,000 several years ago to 110,000 years before that to half a million back in the very beginning days. So I, I wanna use this screen. It's one of many that we see when we're doing our coaching. It's uh, actually quite a bit of time each day that we go in and take a look at it for you guys. There's a dashboard area that we have access to where we can look at an individual's numbers or group numbers. We do look at the group to kind of get some focus for the day and see who's done the readings, who hasn't, who uh, might be a little bit in an alarm stage or whatnot. We, then we come to this data list page, which is our group. That's why you see the red here. Um, that's covering everybody's name because we don't want to advertise whose name is what. Um, I've sorted this list by HRV score, so the lowest score is on top for this particular day. The highest score is on bottom, and we don't know who is what, but we can talk to all this detail because these are all the numbers we look at. Um, you guys doing HRV regularly understand, I'm sure, that there's a lot of information there. It's probably pretty confusing. I know that Shannon and I were doing it several years before we even brought it to um, our clients. <clears throat> and then over here, also you can see for trends, there's groups and individuals. And we use most of these pages. I don't use a group trend very much because we're not training a team per se. But we do use the individual and group data page. We do use the individual and group dashboard and we use the individual trends. When we get to the second video, you'll see how we actually go through breaking down analysis of an individual's day um, and that'll be using my information. Where we're going with this is so far to date, those of you doing heart rate variability with us, we, um, <clears throat> we've been using more of a coaching oversight and guidance um, process. And the more we learn uh, about the numbers and what it means and the value of it and understand the interpretation or the analysis and application, the more we see that we need to be doing more with you guys on this. So we've invested into more education. We're putting more time into looking at the numbers and we want to work with the people who want to be worked with more closely. We want to work more closely and specifically on getting the numbers to a healthier place. As you can see, we have a broad spectrum of numbers and I'll explain some of that, like I said here pretty soon, but we want to focus on, helping those who are doing well and, and their numbers to maintain well, maybe get better, but definitely looking to also work at the ones with the lower numbers that are showing more signs of stress and distress on the body to find ways to mitigate that, to address it and to work through it so that their numbers can come up so that stress 
doesn't serve as an increased risk to make them more continuously sick, um, less resilient to negativity or cravings, or it, it just um, stress comes out in a, a myriad of ways. And, and there's a lot of things that affect it, anywhere from genetics to medications to alcohol to what you eat to what, how you think and what you think. Um, it all shows up. So it's, it's going to get into what these numbers mean. So what we're looking at here, first column is your readiness score. You guys are familiar with that. It's color-coded green, red, yellow. Green does not necessarily mean, hey, everything's kosher, good to go. And red does not necessarily mean, oh my gosh, you're in critical condition, go to the hospital. Um, <clears throat> it's a reference piece of information that has to do with other values. And we'll get to that. So it's not jump up and cheer or, or woe is me type of thing. We do look at your autonomic nervous system balance. So are you more sympathetic driven or more parasympathetic driven? You always have both going on, but one is going to be driving harder, louder, stronger than the other one. And so doing that morning readiness reading first thing in the morning tells us how you're starting your day, which gives us information, you and us information as to what to do during the day. I mean, can you take on more? Should you take on more? Should you do other things to help recover more? It's a lot to do with how well you sleep. <clears throat> and it's a lot to do with how you handled the stress from the prior day. Um, S is sympathetic drive, which is more of a stress, fight, flight, fright, freeze type of thing. PS is parasympathetic, which is the yin to the yang for sympathetic. And that is the rest, digest, grow, recover um, process. So it, it's, it's good that we have these things as, as humans. We've evolved and lived this long because we can generate that sympathetic response when we need it. We can fight. We can flee. We can do what's necessary in a moment's notice to activate the systems in our body. What wasn't uh, part of the evolution of man was the rapid ascent to today's world where we have tons of mental aspects and not physical aspects necessarily that we need to address. Um, <clears throat> and then our ability to shift into a parasympathetic mode is another reason we can go into stress, but that's meant for an acute short-term thing. We shift back into parasympathetic where we can digest our food, we can rest, we can recover. That's the growth phase for humans um, or all animals. And so we need to be able to do both. So it's neither good, again, good nor bad to be in one or the other. It's definitely not good to be sympathetic all the time. Um, it's not good to be parasympathetic all the time. We need to be bouncing between and, and appropriately. HRV is the heart rate variability. Um, hopefully everyone by now knows that heart rate variability is not heart rate. So like this person's a 31, that doesn't mean their heart beat 31 times in a minute. That means that they scored one to 100, they're a 31 for the variability of the heartbeat. The more variable the heartbeat can be, the more it can respond to all the nuances necessary to maintain all the systems in the body, then the better it can do its job, the healthier you are. Um, the lower the number, the more stressed, the, more, uh, the less resilient your body is able to handle all the electrical stimuli and, and, and nervous applications. Um, so in general, the higher your number, the better, but that's not on any one particular day. If it's a, if you're 31 today and 83 tomorrow, that's not necessarily a good thing. A couple of the smaller detailed numbers we look at when we analyze, which there's several of them, there's RMSSD, there's the natural log of that number or the LN RMSSD. There's an NN50, which is the number of sequential beats that are 50 milliseconds apart. I don't watch that number very much because with the addition of these power numbers, um, which demand a four minute or longer reading, I do five minutes now, but with some people doing two and a half or three minutes, some people doing four, some people doing five, I think you can guess that the number of beats is determinant on how long you're taking a reading. Um, so what I look at is the PNN50, which is the percent of all the readings taken 
what's the percentage of readings that are sequential beats that are beyond 50 milliseconds? This does have a pretty standard um, basis for what is considered healthy and good versus too much stress or unhealthy. Same as the SDNN, which is the standard deviation of those end-to-end -end or the inner beat intervals. So the standard deviation is a time-based number. These are milliseconds. And again, it, it's statistics. And I know most people don't like that. <laughs> I love it. I, I love math. Um, but the standard deviation in milliseconds is looking at, again, those beat-to-beat -beat intervals that are uh, varying in time and what is the standard deviation across, you know, the deviation parameters. What is the standard deviation for your beat-to-beat -beat that day? And you can see here we're varying anywhere from, uh, looks like 20 is in the low end and it goes up through the 50s, the 90s, and then up to 200 even. So it, it's a pretty wide variant number. We also look at your seven day average HRV. This is a little bit more weighted average. It's over the last seven days, so it's not a fixed week. It's the last seven days cumulatively, what's your total average? And this is part, one of the numbers that goes in the algorithm of determining whether you're green you know, well, green is determined purely whether you're a 7, 8, 9, or 10, you're, then you're green. If you're 4, 5, or 6, you're yellow. If you're 1, 2, or 3, you're red. So apart from that, it determines the, the severity of the change is what's your seven-day average, what's your today's reading, and then how much are you bouncing back and forth day to day, which is the coefficient of variance, the seven-day HRV CV. CV is coefficient of variance. Um, this is another important number to watch. So your coefficient of variance is how much work is your body having to do day to day to try to bring you back to normal. If you're swinging up and down huge numbers, then this number is going to be higher. If you're pretty tight and you only change a little bit day to day, the number is going to be smaller. Um, and this also has standard numbers for what is healthy and what is unhealthy. So HRV has some standard numbers, SDNN, PNN50, and the seven day average. These all have numbers that are, are pretty well accepted as to far as what means what. Uh, we're parsing through this information when we're working with your numbers and looking at you. Um, again, it's having to take in considerations also is, are you under medications? If so, what ones? They all stress the body. Um, what's your diet like? What's your uh, intake for alcohol and water and juices and things like that? Those all affect the body. Um, the, the stress, the not autonomic nervous system. Uh, what's your general mindset? You know, you, maybe you've got uh, something going on at work or something going on in your relationship, um, something that's swinging you largely. Well, this is going to show up in this. And these are the things we're looking to work with people over time because you can't stop stress and stress isn't a bad thing. Just like going to the gym, that's a stress. You need to lift weights. You need to cycle through different levels you need to go through stress, but you also need to healthfully work your way through stress. And this is a dashboard insight into looking at that saying, how well do I do that? If you do it well, that's great. That's reinforcement as to keep doing it or let's tweak it and get a little bit better at it. But if you're not doing it and you, if you're not doing it well and you think you're doing it well, that's a danger. Um, stress is the number one all cause comorbidity driving most of the top diseases. Um, chronic stress is, is one of the highest killer things going on. That's a technical term, killer things. <laughs> um, we look at your heart rate as well because that's relative to that stress. You know, kind of a standard stress response is an elevated heart rate and a decreasing heart rate variability. Um, and they can mean different things at different times, whether heart rate variability is up or down, heart rate is up or down. Those all coincide to communicate something um, to us as with these other numbers. And then, of course, your weighted average for your heart rate, that gives us a little bit more idea of who you are normally. You might have something that causes your heart rate to go up really high or, or, or something one day, but that's a one-day one day anomaly. You're right back down. That weighted average, again, on a seven-day rolling average, gives us a, a better view of it, like where's somebody here? A lot of people here are dialed in pretty tight. You know, they're, they're reading the same thing. This first person, 92 heart rate this day, 83 average. So they're up 
by nine points um, this one day. And they're down a little bit in their HRV. They're 15%, which is a high number for a coefficient of variance. They're down, quote unquote, only three points on their HRV, but they're up high on their heart rate. And they're quite low on their power also. And we'll get to that in just a second. So that tells me that they're under some stress. Um, and it might be ongoing. That seven day average, their lifetime number might be 50. But the last seven days, they're 34. So something quite significant. They, they might be under a week and a half of flu or something. Um, so And they're still down low for that. Uh, that's part of the communication of going on, checking in, going, hey, what are you doing? But you can see these numbers are pretty much the same here. Um, this was an open reading that this person did when they came through, so some of the numbers aren't part of that for the morning readiness. You can see right here, this person's had a seven-day average of 75. Today, they were 61. So that's actually the other way, the heart rate's lower. There are standards also for a healthy heart rate range, um, so we are looking to get to that. Um, total power, this is a, these all are time domain things. These are frequency domain things. So it's, what's the frequency? As you might guess, power, the stronger your signal is, the more power you have, that's good. Your power should be a higher number. So the lower numbers or weaker signals means they're less resilient. They're, uh, more strongly affected by things because they, you know, I'm sure you can imagine deadlifting. Someone who is not very strong, who can only deadlift maybe 50 pounds versus someone who can deadlift 100, someone who can deadlift 200, someone who can deadlift 400. The 400 pound deadlift person is a lot stronger, a lot more resilient in their ability to execute physical demands. The person who can only do 50 is not very strong and not going to be able to handle much physical demand. So, you know, you will suffer those consequences as a result. There are standards for what is um, perceived to be st sufficiently strong enough uh, power. And then also anecdotally, I watch it over time to see what people are reading and where they're at and what's going on so that we can come up with realistic numbers for our group. Under total frequency of power, there's a high frequency and a low frequency factor. High frequency correlates to your parasympathetic or your rest and digest um, part. The low frequency correlates mostly with the sympathetic. So we're, all, we're looking at those two types of things and we're looking at the balance of power for your morning readiness and that's the ratio. A balance of power um, at two or below is preferably where one would be that shows adequate recovery from the prior day and the ability to move on and, and um, accomplish normal tasks. 10 is considered high, um, out of balance, so that would be something that we watch. Like right here, this person is at 20, this person's at 23 and a half almost. So these are people I would make a note of and go back and look at the next day. And if they're not getting that ratio back down, you know, this is a decent power signal level here. This is getting in the range of pretty weak, especially here. So what's going on? You can either have a, uh, if your total power is low or your ratio is high, that can either be because the corresponding number is very weak or the other number is very strong. So either one of those can come into play. Like in this one, the parasympathetic tone is actually very weak, which is strange because they're parasympathetic today. They're one point higher than their average, which is quite low at 39. So that might be part of it there is they're already under a continuous chronic stage of stress, which might be causing their inability to strongly activate the parasympathetic um, nerve systems. So that, that might be something for us to work with on that person. And then you get down here to higher numbers, um, 7,000, 6,000, 10,000. Those are pretty strong, resilient numbers. Those, those are pretty good. Even in the, the upper hundreds, from what I'm seeing, upper hundreds are still pretty decent. Um, it's not what I see in most people, honestly, but um, definitely downward in the range of 300, 200, 100 and stuff that those are points to be working on um, and, and take a look at. 
So I, I, I hope this video explains some of the numbers. I know I haven't given the details of anything. Some of them are generalizations um, as far as depends on the, the bias of the group that you're in. Males and females score a little bit differently in HRV and power. Um, it has a lot to do with genetics. It has a lot to do with age. It has more so to do with your training and your diet and your lifestyle. Those are the most significant factors. Along with that is, the, and like I said earlier, medications you take um, that strongly influences uh, your heart rate variability because that, that's a huge stress on the body. Same as uh, tobacco, um, any food sensitivities or intolerances, you'll see a huge shift in your HRV and your heart rate numbers and your power. If you eat something that you're um, intolerant to, like maybe if you have a, a gluten disease or sensitivity and you eat something with gluten in it, then that's going to bounce back and show you some pretty bad numbers. So that's really good reasons on all fronts to be <clears throat> tracking your HRV every day. Um, and if you don't necessarily want to go through the five or six years of education and training to get up to speed on it like we have, <clears throat> excuse me, then having a coach to oversee it is, is something you'll want to consider and, and do. And it's something that we recommend. We do it. We've done it every day for about five and a half years, I think. Our family does it. Our daughter does it. And um, we all make adjustments on our day or watch it. You know, yellow doesn't mean that we're going to freeze on that day, but it, it definitely means that we're going to make some adjustments. So finishing up this video, let's look at one quick example here, because right? I know everybody gets caught up in the gamification of the traffic light semaphore of you know green, yellow, red, and judgments and tags of good and bad and all that kind of stuff. So let's look at an example. I picked this day because there's three scores of 56, all right? And there's a couple of close scores of a 55 and a 58 just on the periphery of those. But in each of these 56s, one person's green, one person's yellow, one person's red. Um, so is 56 good or bad? In general, 56, it's on the lower end, but 56 is a pretty decent number from a heart rate variability standpoint. If you're uh, an athlete or someone who's otherwise pretty generally healthy, you've got nothing going on that's um, uh, any, any disease, uh, you're well-conditioned, well-trained, all those types of things, then yeah, 56 is going to be a pretty low number. Um, people like that are usually upwards around high 60s, low 70s, mid 70s. Um, endurance athletes are usually 70s and 80s. Uh, high level performing endurance athletes are usually 80s to 100. And then um, those type of people, if they get down in the 50s, something's usually pretty bad between their training, the recovery or whatnot. General population, people who are dealing with normal stresses and multiple things going on, um, I've noticed that 50s seem to be fairly normal. You can definitely do things to get your number higher into the 60s. I personally, as a coach, would love to see people on the earmark of 60, 58, 59, 60, 65 in that range or better. Um, and then going down into the 40s, 30s, 20s, 20s is definitely really low. We want to see people get out of that if they drop down into it. Um, and if you reside in there for a long time, we definitely are looking to, to work with people in those numbers and, and find ways to get them out of that and, and you know, find if, if that's possible. Um, because again, you don't know what someone is potentially capable of. There's a lot of factors that get involved in, you know, in a consideration, but all these other numbers tell us things as well. Um, so, uh, the 56 is right. So this 56, this person is a red parasympathetic three. So they have a really strong rest recovery process. So you can see their seven day average is normally 43 today they or this day they scored a 56, which gets them a red three, very strong parasympathetic signal. And you can see they're at a 20% coefficient of variance. So they've been bouncing around quite a bit. Their heart rate is lower than it was, so they're coming out of, an, of a time probably where they were under high stress, and now they're recovering back up. I'd have to look at their individual trend to verify that, but that's what that seems like. Um, this 56 
is a sympathetic yellow four. So this person is under a pretty strong stress drive. Um, they have been a 67 over the last seven days. They're now a 56, so that's a pretty big drop. Um, what is that, 11 points? So yeah, that's, that's definitely, in my, in my terms of uh, changing more than 10 points, I consider changing more than 10 points to be a red day no matter what. This person almost got a red day. They're at 8.9%, which is in the range in between of seven and 10. Anything under seven is clean, good, perfectly fine. I've expanded that for our applications to be 10%, anything over 10%. There's enough variance day to day in your numbers that that's adding stress load to the body. That's like doing a lot of heavy deadlifts day after day after day. It wears you down. Um, it becomes defeating and depressing and, and very difficult. You, you get exhausted with these high number swings. Um, and then this person is a, a eight parasympathetic. So they're a little bit higher than they're normal recently. They're recently a 54, they're a 56 today. So just a slightly higher. And they're usually dialed in pretty tight at five and a half percent variance. Um, they are a somewhat relatively weak uh, power signal. And then something that's um, a little different is they have a stronger parasympathetic signal than their sympathetic signal. So they've got very low stress tone and a, a moderate strength uh, relaxation tone, um, which gives them a less than a one ratio. So it's, that's an interesting thing I'm researching and investigating because it's not often that you're that low. Here's another person who's a 0 0.5, 0 0.95. So we have a couple of you guys doing that. Um, so that's, that's a point of interest. And I, I dig into your charts and look at that when that's going on. But so you can see right there, red, yellow, green isn't necessarily slam dunk celebration or a row is me party. The numbers are relative to other things. Nothing's happening immediately. Um, but this is what we're looking to do, increase the communication with people's readings, getting you guys to act more readily on the signal and asking questions when you're not sure what to do. Uh, we're in and out of this several times, but that doesn't mean we're checking it right after you got it to where we can signal you. Sometimes we can't send a message until later in the day. Um, so asking questions is a good thing and continuing on coaching, I think, is a very good thing. Hopefully this explains some of the numbers when I get into the individual videos that you guys are gonna see me doing for me. You'll see what's coming at you. I'm gonna be a little bit more direct into how your HRV score fits into the overall uh, healthy, unhealthy, questionable range and how the rest of your numbers pair in. And then um, we'll see how that conversation comes about. All right, so thank you. And um, stay tuned in a couple of days, you'll see the videos for my, um, my analysis coming out. All right, thank you.